you would remain standing and turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 to 20. Let's ask our Lord's blessing on the reading of his word, and then we'll read. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, as we come now to your word, permit us to use old words to express a current desire. Lord God, what we know not, teach us. What we are not, make us. What we have not, give us. In Jesus' name, amen. And so we continue in our study through Matthew 18, picking things up with our Lord's instructions in verse 15. And this is what we read. Jesus says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say to you, if two, of, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Today we come to a very difficult passage but a vital passage for the life of Christ's church. We come to a passage that describes the instructions for what has come to be known as church discipline. Church discipline. And in general, in our current world today, our culture, the idea of discipline, and certainly being disciplined, does not play very well. And so when you think of church discipline, it's very easy to conjure up images of some dictatorial elder board or maybe the classic thoughts of how the the world views the Puritans, you know, the puritanical, legalistic, you know, horrible witch hunts that only desire to condemn people and exclude people from the church. It's easy to think of that kind of thing. But in truth, those images could not be farther from the reality of what church discipline is all about. Because Jesus gives us these instructions regarding this discipline in Matthew 18 here in the context of sharing what it means to love one another. What it means to love one another enough so that when we see a brother or sister kind of like a sheep wandering away from the fold, we see that brother or sister falling away into sin to love them enough to do what it takes to bring them back, to save them from the destruction that that sin will most certainly cause in their lives. And so this thing called church discipline is actually rooted not in malice, not in hate, not in legalism, but in love. Love for Christ, love for Christ's church, and love for one another. Now, the presence and the focus on love does not mean it's not still discipline. It is discipline, and there is difficulty to it. We need to listen to the author of Hebrews when he writes uh, on two, two main points. He writes, for the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. And so it's our purpose today to examine what our Lord has to say about church discipline, recognizing the difficulty of it, how hard it is to actually put in practice, but desiring to be trained by it. So that we ourselves, as individual believers and as a church body, could produce the peaceful fruits of righteousness. To that end, I hope to answer three questions about church discipline. Number one, why do we do it? If it is difficult, if it is going to feel painful, why do it? Secondly, if we're going to do it, how do we do it? 
What are the steps that God has given to us? And then thirdly, again, if it's going to be so painful, if it's going to be such a serious matter, by what authority do we do this thing called church as one? So why, how, and by what authority do we do this? Let's jump into the why. Again, if no discipline seems pleasant, but it all feels painful, why do it in the first place? Well, there's two reasons why. One reason that we really hope will happen. The other reason we don't really hope will happen, but if it does, it's necessary anyway. Let me explain. The first thing, the, 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 first, the, the hope that we want to see happen when it comes to church discipline, and we're going to explain the process in a moment, but the idea is that someone sins, and all sin destroys Sin is not okay to leave in, a li- leave in a life of a believer because it will work destruction. So the idea is that someone sins, and in this case, someone sins against someone else, and so that person goes to them and says, hey, you sinned against me. The hope is then for admission of guilt, not to beat that person down, but to bring them to understand, yes, I sinned, and then ask for forgiveness and receive forgiveness. That those people would be reconciled together. Forgiveness sought, forgiveness given, reconciliation, and restoration. That is the primary hope and goal of church discipline. That we would be preserved together as God's people. And that is a good thing. Just consider the very last verses of the book of James in the New Testament. The very last verses read this way. James writes, My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Similarly, actually, you go back to the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. In Daniel 12, 3, Daniel is describing some of the things that will happen on the day of the Lord's return. And he writes, And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Surely it is a good thing to be counted amongst the wise. Surely it is a good thing to be counted amongst those who turn their brothers and sisters away from sin and toward Christ's righteousness. And so once again, the desire of church discipline is not condemnation, but restoration and reconciliation. And we see this goodness, we see this hope, even in Christ's own instructions. Because there in the very first step, he says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. You've gained your brother. Another way to translate that would be, you have won your brother. Not at all meaning that church discipline is an argument back and forth, and so you need to win that argument. No. That's not what church discipline is. It's the process of saying, here's the sin. There needs to be repentance and reconciliation. And if that happens, then the prize, the reward Is that brother, is that person being restored? You've gained your brother. The church remains whole and strong in unity together because of that process of reconciliation. Because to not do that, to see the sin, to experience the sin coming at you, and to do nothing... That is to say, go ahead, go off and be lost in your sin. But the goal is not to let our our brothers and sisters become lost, but to gain them back. To bring the wandering sheep back into the fold. Now, in this process, must judgments be, be made? Yes. Judgment calls need to be made. We need to be able to recognize sin as sin. But the point, again, is not to bring people to judgment, but to warn people of judgment so that they can avoid that judgment, so that they can avoid the consequences of that sin. So everything about church discipline in its primary desire and hope is positive. 
to love one another enough to bring each other back out of that sin to the strength of a united church. But there's a second thing that might happen in this process. It's not what we hope for, but if it comes to it, it is good. Nevertheless, it is necessary because it might happen that people go through the entire process of church discipline, which we'll lay out in a few minutes. They might go through that whole process and they remain unrepentant. They remain, they remain steadfast in their rebellion, in their defiance, despite their sin. And in that case, Jesus makes it clear that we are required to put that person outside the church. To consider them to be an unbeliever. And this must happen to preserve the security and the purity of the church. The Apostle Paul addresses this basic situation with the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church had a lot of problems. He was helping them work through things one at a time, basically. And one of those problems was sin running rampant in the church. Sin in, in very defiant ways. And so to, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul writes, I wrote to you in my letter, there was a previous letter before this, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. That was the sin in the church that he's addressing. But then he clarifies, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world, or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother, if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed, or is an idolater, a reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. You see, the Apostle Paul is readily admitting here that there's a lot of sin and wickedness in the world. And that's to be expected. The wicked is going to wicked. It is what it is. But when it comes to those who claim to belong to Christ, it ought not be so. Sin should not be in Christ's church like it is in the world. Now to be clear, and please hear me on this, I do not want anyone to go away confused. It is one thing to struggle with sin. To admit your sin, to strive against that sin, and to seek help in overcoming that sin. Hopefully that's where we all are, because we all have sin. We all struggle with sin, right? And that kind of situation doesn't call for church discipline. That calls for brotherly love and encouragement and counseling and, and prayer. But... If we claim to be Christians and yet we indulge in sin in an unrepentant manner with, with defiant hearts, not just struggling with sin, but defiant and loving our sin, then that is not to be tolerated in Christ's church. The scriptures say that that person must be purged. They must be removed from the fellowship of God's people. And that might seem extreme, it is not extreme. It is actually very reasonable. And it is perfectly in line with what our Lord has already taught earlier in Matthew 18. You may remember, in part, he said, if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. Now, we, we remember that he was speaking, he was you know, using an illustration, he was speaking figuratively here. We do not need to literally cut off our hands or our feet. But the, the vividness of that image drives home to us how serious sin is and how we should be willing to do whatever it takes to get rid of the source of that sin in our lives. In the same way, if someone in the church body remains willfully obstinate in their sin, despite the loving warnings of God's people, then that person is going to be nothing but a cancer in the church body. They will be a source of sin, tempting others constantly to follow them in their sinful defiance. 
And just like in the physical world, the medical world, if someone is diagnosed with cancer and it's operable, if they want to live, they will have the operation to cut that cancer out before it spreads. And again, just the same way, the Lord makes clear that such a source of sin and destruction should also be removed from his body, the body of believers, before it can be spread any further. So our Lord commands church discipline for two distinct reasons. The primary hope to bring people to reconciliation and restoration, to keep them in the body of Christ through uh, the process of admitting guilt, confession of sin, and then free forgiveness in return. But then, yes, it's true, the fail-safe kicks in if the person in question remains defiant, that they would be removed, even as as a cancer would be removed, so that they would not affect others with their sin. So... We love one another enough to keep one another from wandering away. And we love Christ's church enough to keep it secure and pure, even as he instructed. Now, with these reasons why in mind, we consider how is it that Jesus commands us to do these things? How do we go about it? Well, three steps, and they're pretty simple, which does not mean easy. I will say it time and again here in the next however long. There is nothing easy about the process of church discipline. But it is good, it is necessary, and it is a simple matter. Because Jesus says, first, uh, the first of three steps, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. The first thing to mention here is that Jesus says, if your brother sins against you, Now, again, to be clear, there are other scriptures, I believe, that indicate that we can see a brother or a sister in sin, and even if that sin is not against us directly, we can go and speak to them about that sin. We need to love them enough to not let sin reign in their lives. But Jesus is is specifying, in this case, if it's against you, which at the very least should let us know that church discipline is not about those witch hunts. Church discipline is not about examining your brother's life, hunting and pecking for any opportunity to bring him under discipline. No, it's not that at all. In the same way, Jesus specifies that when your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. That's the simple but very difficult part. But to do it between the two of you alone. Similar to the idea that we're not hunting hunting and pecking for every little thing we could bring a charge against one another about. We're also not trying to make it a big deal in the church immediately. If there's sin, we're not to drag that person's name through the mud by telling everybody about it as soon as possible. No, the point is to restore a broken relationship, not to get vengeance by destroying their reputation through gossip. So this initial step, if someone sins against you in the church, you don't go telling other people about it. You love them enough to go to them yourself and speak to them about it privately. Because once again, we are called to bear with one another, to be merciful to one another, to love one another enough to not gossip, to not spread it around, to go relying on the Lord's strength to go to them one-on-one and resolve the issue. Because once again, if you do this, you share how they've sinned against you, and, and, and if all goes well, and praise the Lord if it does, they say, oh, man, I, I'm sorry. You know what, I realize now I did do that. Would you forgive me? And you forgive them. And there it is. That's the end of the process. Restoration has been achieved. Right? So, so you don't go on to step two. It's, it's, it's done. And no one else had to know about it. Which is a good thing. It's just between the two of you in the beginning. Keep it between the two of you. And if there's restoration, if there's reconciliation, praise the Lord. It doesn't go any further. But of course, as Jesus anticipates, there's, 
there's going to be times where that person is not willing to admit any guilt, not willing to confess sin or repent. And so we ask, all right, well, what happens then? Well, Jesus shares, he says, if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. Now, it's crucial here to understand both what is happening, what our Lord is commanding, and to make sure we understand what is not happening, okay? Because what is not happening is the point here is not that having met resistance the first time, now you go get a posse of your friends and go over and gang up on them. That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is actually referencing back to one of the principles found in the law of Moses, In Deuteronomy 19.15, we read, A single witness shall not suffice against a person for any crime or for any wrong in connection with any offense that he has committed. Only on the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses shall a charge be established. And if you continue reading that passage, it makes it very clear that that is intended to protect the accused. So the fact that Jesus is drawing on this principle, this law from Deuteronomy, indicates that church discipline itself has built into it protections for the accused to make sure that the accused are not being accused falsely or maliciously. Because the point is that in the second step, the person who claims that the other person sinned has to take witnesses with him or her. Not necessarily people who witnessed the original sin that that started all this, but people who can be witness to the process as it moves forward. And let me just throw out there to you for our application today that church elders are great witnesses in this way to be involved in this process, to be able to uh, establish whether the charge is legitimate or not. So in the step two, these witnesses go along with not to gang up on the person, but to establish whether or not the charge is legitimate in the first place. Because it's it's happened to me in the past. I'm sure it's happened to you. An offense is caused, whichever side of the offense you might be on. And then, unfortunately, with the way that we are in our sinfulness, it might be weeks or months before we get it hashed out. It happened to me once many years ago, a rift in a relationship. It took a month before we got back together and it turned out it was a misunderstanding. In this process, the witnesses go say, you know, to the first person, you know what? We've heard both sides. I don't think they meant to do that. Let's clear up the misunderstanding and then have reconciliation that way. We certainly hope this isn't the case, but as I mentioned, this is protections for the accused. It might be that the person who made the charge, you sinned against me, they might have made it falsely. These witnesses can hear both sides and actually determine, you know what? He didn't sin, she didn't sin. You're making this charge falsely. Do you see that? Maybe it was a misunderstanding, clear it up, but maybe it was malicious. If it was malicious, then the witnesses don't gang up on the original person that was supposedly sinning. Nobody gangs up on anybody anyway, but you know, then they turn to that person and say, you're making a spurious allegation. You need to apologize and ask for forgiveness for that. Right? But if there was actual sin, if it becomes clear that the person did sin and it was legitimate, then the witnesses turn to that person and with compassion and gentleness still implore them to repent, to seek forgiveness. And of course, if they at that point do listen, you forgive, you reconcile, and it's, and it's over. And praise be to God if that's the case. But again, if they still refuse, if the love of two or three or four people is not enough to convince them to come back, what do we do then? Well, Jesus says, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. 
And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. This is the point where the matter becomes public. Part of the point of church discipline up until this time is to not make things public. Not everyone in the church body needs to know about every conflict or every sin. If it can be resolved, if it can be repented of, if if the person can turn and be forgiven without the whole church knowing, great, we do not need constant shock waves going throughout the whole church body on these matters. But if the person who sinned, they're basically now compounding their sin by continuing to defy, continuing to refuse to repent, despite the loving uh, uh, you know, warnings of, of the fellow believers, they are now, by Christ's own command, supposed to be brought before the whole church. And when he says the church, he means the people of the church. This is not just symbolic for saying before the elder board, but still keep it from everyone else. No, before the church. But again, the point here is not to condemn either. The world would convince you that it is. That the church just wants to condemn people. Just gather around that person, rake them over the coals. Um, you know, shout shame, shame at them. But no, even now, the idea of bringing this person before the whole church is not to bury them with the weight of the church's judgment and hate and scorn. No, it's that the person could then feel the weight of the church's love for them in begging them to repent of their sin and so be restored. It's it's to, to share a love with that person, a love that says we are not willing to sit idly by and watch you run headlong for the cliff's edge. We love you enough to come after you and call you out of that sin, to spare you from that destruction. Turn away from your sin and be restored. And friends, I've mentioned it before, I'll, I'll say it again as powerfully as I can right now. This process that we're talking about is going to be one of the most difficult things that ever happens in the church. Possibly even in your own life. And I hope and pray that we never get to that, this, this final point of church discipline with anyone here, with any of our membership, with any of our leadership, with my, me, myself. I hope it never, ever happens. But if it comes to it, if it does get to that point where someone needs to be brought before the church as a whole, let us recognize the love that that is supposed to point to. Yes, at that point, everybody would know their sin. It can't be hidden anymore. But the way we as a church body react to that is not with scorn. Because guess what? We were saved by the grace of God too. We have sin too. Therefore mercy must reign toward that person. A humble heart attitude of gratitude and thanksgiving for our own salvation must reign. And if that person does repent at that point, the immediate reaction of the church could be one of joyful restoration. Not grumbling at them, like we talked about the shepherd that might grumble having to go get the sheep. No, not grumbling, not holding against them, not keeping it over their heads. Remember when you did that? No, joyful restoration. Assuring them that we love them and forgive them and their sin will never be held against them again. This is the kind of love, even at this point, that we need to have for one another because this is the kind of love that God has for all of us. Amen? That is the... If, it, if the situation gets this far, that's what we hope will happen. But it may not. If the person remains steadfast in their sin even then... Jesus tells us what to do then. He says, and if he refuses to listen even to the church, 
let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Which is to say, treat him or her, consider them to be a person outside the covenant community. Treat them as someone who does not belong to the Lord, as an unbeliever. Again, not even at this point does it mean we can now unleash both barrels of hatred and scorn. No, because even if we consider them an enemy, what did Christ tell us to do to our enemies? But to love them, right? But at this point, we need to understand the status and the full status of this person. Because they've been unrepentant throughout this whole process. And no one is saying it needs to be a quick process. No one is saying that you do step one on Monday, step two on Tuesday, step three on Wednesday, then kick them out. The process itself can be mercifully long, giving them many, many opportunities before it gets to this point. But if they remain defiant in their rebellion against God, not just the church, but against God, then as long as they remain in that unrepentance, they are demonstrating that they are acting like those who do not belong to God. And therefore, the reality may be that they don't belong to God. That they truly are unbelievers, despite what things might have looked like beforehand. And when we take Paul's instructions in mind as well, this means that we would put that person outside the church. They are struck from the membership roles, and then we have no more fellowship with them. They're not permitted to come in and attend. You're not to go out to eat with them. You're not to go over to their house unless it be to call them to repentance again. Paul makes it very clear to not even eat with such a, a one. And at that point, I say, well, wait, wait a minute. You've been talking about love. How is that loving? Isn't that an act of hatred to just exclude them completely? No fellowship whatsoever? Well, in truth, that at that point, that's the only act of love there is to do. Because you may remember from last week, from the, pro- the parable of the prodigal son, that sometimes it takes being lost in a foreign land without anyone around you who loves you. It takes being lost in a foreign land to come to your senses, to recognize your great sin, and to come back in repentance. And so if that person truly does belong to God, yes, they've already been excluded from the church, but they might still actually belong to God. And if that is the case, they will eventually come to their senses. They will realize that there's nothing in the world for them. And that actually they're lost in the world because the world is not their home. They're living in the wrong kingdom. And they will eventually realize that. And they'll come back. And what do we do? If they, the prodigal son, comes back, we take our cue from the father of the prodigal son. And as soon as we see them coming back, We run to them and we throw our arm around them and we bring them back with joy, with full restoration and great celebration. That's how eager we need to be at every moment, at every point of this process, from the very first step to however long that person remains in the world, eager and ready to forgive eager and ready to restore. But what if that person doesn't come back? What if they are actually happy in the world? They fit in there. They're at home. They never reach a point where they realize that they have nothing and need to come back. If that is the case, then what the Apostle John wrote is proven true about them. That they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that it might become plain that they all are not of us.
If a person goes through this whole process, remains defiant in their unrepentance, they're excluded from the fellowship of, of Christ's people, and they're fine, they're happy, they're satisfied, it proves that they never actually belonged amongst God's people in the first place. And there's nothing joyful about that recognition. But according to that secondary purpose, what happens then is that they remain out there. And at the very least, they will commit their sin out there and not bring it into the church as a cancer. And so the church is preserved and secured from that sin, from that influence. At this point, we have to ask our last question because this is serious. This is one of the most serious things that we might ever do as a church or as Christians. So our last question is, by what authority do we do it? And I do not have the time I would like to have to unpack everything as much as I want to. Um, So we're going to skip verse 18. Um, It's important. We're going to hit it hard, Lord willing, in one of our devotions this week. But I want to go take you to verses 19 and 20, which give the, the essence of what verse 18 is saying anyway. Because in verses 19 and 20, Jesus says, Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. In this incredibly difficult process of church discipline, done for the love of Christ, done for the love of his church, and the love of one another, there's going to be those times where the people that we go to and say, what about the sin? They're going to respond in a defiant manner. They're going to respond in a hostile manner. And they might actually repent afterward. Just because someone responds hostily in the initial does not mean they're not a believer. We all have sin. But if they remain that way, or even if they repent later, that hostility comes, and the words are probably going to come with it. Something to the effect of, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are to try to discipline me and poke and prod your way into my life? And frankly, we need to be able to answer that question. Who do we think we are? Well, we, no one's special. By what right do we do this? Not so much by a right, but by the authority of Christ himself. He has commanded it. He has commissioned it. To that end, let me give you an illustration here. Something a little bit less intense, a little bit maybe. The Great Commission, where our Lord commands, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Did you know that that command is flanked on both sides with his reassuring statement saying, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, as well as, behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Friends, the world does not want us to complete this commission. The world does not want us to proclaim the gospel and make disciples of all the nations. They will say we have no right to proclaim the gospel we, who, who do we think we are to, to say these intolerant and bigoted things like you must come before Jesus Christ alone for salvation? Therefore, the world will cancel us, sanction us, imprison us, kill us for declaring the truth about sin and salvation. But we do it anyway. Despite the world saying we're not allowed to. We do it anyway because Christ has both commanded and commissioned us to do it. He has given us his authority to do it. And it's the same situation with church discipline. The Lord has both commanded and commissioned us to do it here in Matthew 18. And so we do it. We lovingly warn people against sin to call them out of sin. And we do it with Christ's own authority. Because when Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. My friends, he's not talking about poorly attended prayer meetings. Okay? So very often throughout my my life, especially in my home church, and I didn't understand this back then either, 
it wasn't until much, much later that I come to, came to understand this. Um, but the idea of, of having two or three people together for a prayer meeting or for a Bible study or for whatever, and then you kind of sheepishly look at each other because you wish there was more people, but there's not. You know, it's just, well, where two or three are gathered, there he is in their midst, right? But friends, if that's, the, if that's what we're talking about, if it's just his presence with us, just the basic presence of Christ, you don't need two or three people for that. You can be completely alone with no one for thousands of miles around and Christ Jesus is with you. Fully and completely. Because the Holy Spirit dwells within you. That's, that's not what he's saying here. That's not what he's talking about in, the, in terms of just his basic presence. What Jesus is saying when he says, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. He's talking about this process of church discipline. He's saying to us, his disciples, he's saying, I know how difficult it will be for you to conduct this discipline, especially if it goes the distance. But know this, if you're following my instructions, and if you are in agreement among yourselves that the discipline is necessary, then even if there's just a handful of you there in that process, rest assured that I am with you in that decision. You have the full ex extent of my authority to persevere in that process of discipline. Because, my friends, when we have something so very difficult to do, what is it that's going to see it done? What gives us the resolve to do it despite the difficulty. What's going to give us that resolve is understanding fully that we have both the command and the commission to do it. That we have both the instructions and the authority to carry it out for the glory of Christ, for the love of his church, and for the love of even the least of his people to go to the ends of the earth if necessary, to bring them back into the fellowship of God's people to bring them out of sin and to his righteousness so that they would know the love and blessing and grace and mercy and fellowship of God himself. Amen? And we do so with both the, both the love of Christ and the authority of Christ. And I love you all very much, which is why I bring you this message in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Most gracious Father, comfort your people today with your mercy, your grace, your incredible desire and willingness to forgive. And strengthen us to have those same traits with compassion and love. To have a love strong enough to do these difficult things to encourage one another to bear with one another, to forgive one another, to confront one another in love concerning sin. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen.